When we have elections which change the government as dramatically as we did on June the 7th, we tend to replace a lot of experienced politicians with a lot of rookies. More than half of the next group of MPPs in the 42nd Ontario Parliament will be rookies. And we have four of them here tonight. In alphabetical order, we welcome Christine Hogarth, incoming PC member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Butila Carpoche, incoming NDP member for Parkdale High Park. Stephen Lecce, incoming PC member for King Vaughan. And Sarah Singh, incoming NDP member for Brampton Centre. And we are delighted to welcome you four to our table tonight. I want to start just by reminding everybody of what you four all know very well. Sheldon, shall we put the graphic up and remind everybody what happened back on the 7th of June? There it is. A majority progressive conservative government on the strength of more than 40% of the total vote. They have 76 seats, um, two-thirds of whom are first-timers. The New Democrats elected 40 members, more than half of whom are first-timers. The Liberals elected seven. They are all returning members. That's why you see no Liberals at the table here tonight. They have no new MPPs in the Liberal caucus. And, of course, there's one Green rookie uh, on his fourth try. Mike Schreiner won uh, in the riding of Guelph, so the Green Party is... 100% rookie caucus. There we go. I want to start with all of you. Uh, Sarah, start us off here. Election night, 7th of June. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you know you were going to win? No, I had no idea, actually. How um, many votes did you win by? 89 votes. That's uh, tight. So it was very tight. Uh, so our office was uh, very quiet uh, as we waited for that last poll to come in. Uh, you could probably hear a pin drop. But uh, as soon as we got the official results, uh, it was like just pandemonium. Everyone was just excited and uh, yeah. Was, what was the difference before the last poll reported? <laughs> The margin of difference. So to be honest, uh, I think uh, the third poll in, I asked my team to stop telling me <laughs> what the difference was. Um, and once we knew all of the final numbers to let me know what the results were, uh, it was getting a, a little a little tight. Uh, and I'm sure you can understand, uh, anxiety was very high. Now, at 80, 89 vote difference, yeah. how do you know when you get a recount and when you don't have to do a recount? Well, uh, there are timelines. I think it's uh, 25 votes or uh, less uh, you can uh, qualify for a recount. Uh, okay. But I think with 89 votes, uh, I have full faith in Elections Ontario and, and their ability to tabulate those 89 votes and, and make that difference happen. Uh, but it, I think it shows us how close the race really was and uh, what a gr good ground game my team had uh, to make us go for the edge. Christine, election night for you. How was it? it was, I was nervous. I was nervous. Um, we had a, a party going on, of course, an end of election party. I was at home with my husband and my best friend, Christy, and uh, we were watching it, and uh, she had brought a bottle of champagne to, to celebrate. And I said, we're not celebrating. We're not, <laughs> not until we know for sure. And my mother was texting me going, come to the party, come to the party. I said, I can't, until I wanted to see that check mark in the box. And uh, it was back and forth. And then I guess you don't realize how long the alphabet is until you're waiting for the E's <laughs> to come around again. And we were flipping different channels. And, uh, you know, we, we ended up with an over 3,000 percent uh, over 3,000 vote lead which was great but uh, you know was the polls were slow coming in and I didn't want to take anything for granted and as soon as we saw that check mark we called our car and we went to the party <laughs> off to the party you went Stephen how about you election night uh, election night was uh, really surreal I mean I I had a feeling going into this that the, the wave of change was so profound in my riding people were just so determined for change I've been at this for two years uh, and so when you've knocked on every door uh, two or three times, you start to get a good feeling of your constituency. What would the total number of doors have been that you knocked on in those two years? I probably knocked on 75,000 doors uh, over the course of two years. I've knocked on my riding one and a half times, including in the rural communities, which is a bit unprecedented. I took this process seriously, as humbling as it is. I mean, I should say up the top, it is incredible mm. uh, to be here. On election night, my grandmother, who's 94, Nona Leche, uh, who's just an amazing woman, came to the country with not a dime in her pocket, just with a whole bunch of hope and sort of an aspiration to achieve. And, you know, she was in the room, and I didn't really know what I was going to say in my remarks. I don't know for you guys if you had prepared remarks, but I thought I wanted to make it about her sacrifice to honour it. And she was just so emotional. I'm not the world's most emotional person. I probably need to work on that, Steve. But <laughs> it was very impactful to see both my mom and my dad, just their embrace in the private room before we went downstairs, like just... Honestly, that is the one memory I'll ever forever remember, is just them, the sense of pride they had. And like for two years of grinding, it was worth it for that. Like that alone makes me feel like I did the right thing. Even if I lost the sense of pride my parents have, that's really special for me. I'm really happy I made them proud and I want to make the, my constituency proud by working very hard. Sarah won by 89 votes. 
Yours wasn't quite so close. <laughs> I think you won by more than 20,000. That's right, 22,000, I think. Yeah. 22,000 votes. <laughs> so can we infer from that that election night for you was not quite the nail biter it might have been for others <laughs> at this table? Well, election day, I had a very good feeling because um, I spent my day visiting all the different zone houses in the riding. And, uh, what, what do you mean zone houses? So zone houses are basically houses that are set up in the different zones that your riding is divided into. Okay. And that is pretty much where election day's ground game is run out of. So each area has its own mini campaign office through which volunteers are dispatched, they come report, they pull out the vote and all of that. So we had about five of those in the riding. And I visited every zone house, and I have to tell you, it was so busy. We had, I think, about 600 volunteers all together pulling out the vote. There was lots of energy. Everywhere I walked around in the riding, people were, like, screaming across the street saying, I voted for you. My social media was pinging nonstop. So I was like... So you knew you were going to win. I had a good feeling, but... <laughs> You never know for sure, right? Hmm. Uh, so I just, w I, I, I was at home with my family uh, election night and uh, my campaign manager gave me a call. I was actually, I had your show on. <laughs> well, I know why you had our program on. Because <laughs> your boss used to, was one of our guests yes, that night. Yes, yes. And also because the... You should uh, just explain that. Sherry, you worked in Sherry DeNovo's office. Your predecessor right. is yes. the member there. Yes, and she was on the panel and yeah. I wanted to watch uh, what was being discussed uh, pre-election. Uh, results came coming in. And, uh, but, you know, our campaign offices actually get the returns before, I think, the media does, because we have scrutinies on the ground. Mm -hmm. And our results started coming in from West first, from the West region, and that's the part of the riding that we traditionally don't do very well in. In fact, we lose often in that part of the riding. And what were those numbers saying? Overwhelmingly, we were winning it. So if we were winning that region of the riding, we, we, were thought, we knew we were in good shape. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is a big deal, but a lot of people have said it to me, so mm -hmm. I assume it's a big deal for some people. Yeah. You are the first person of Tibetan origin, well, uh, ever elected in Ontario history. Yes. In Canadian history? Yes. Really? And, and in North America. In North American history? That's right. How, is that a big deal for you? Well, it's obviously, you know, a great honor. Uh, I feel very proud of this achievement, but the goal was really to just become the MPP for Park Dale High Park, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the the historic significance was a byproduct of it. Uh, I obviously appreciate, and the significance is not lost on me, but uh, the real honor is that the people of Park Dale High Park chose me as their representative. They placed their trust in me. Were you born over there or here? Oh, not born in Canada, no. I was born in Nepal. You're born in Nepal? Yeah. Okay. And came here when? When I was 18 years old in 2002. You obviously spoke, learned English over there. Yes, yeah. I did. <laughs> okay. All right. That's it. I didn't realize it was all of North America. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty historic. Let's go uh, around the table on this. I mean, in some respects, you are not all, you know, brand new to politics as some MPPs are. There really are some people who get elected for the first time who don't have a clue where the bathrooms at Queen's Park are, right? I mean, you've, you've worked in politics for a long time. Sarah? You've worked in politics for a long time. Sarah, tell us about your background. How much political engagement in your background? Uh, actually, quite a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, just prior to the election, uh, I was just completing my PhD in public policy at Ryerson University uh, in the field of uh, social policy, actually. Um, so quite a lot of experience there. I was teaching at Ryerson part-time as well. Did you never uh, worked for a member before? Or a I did, minister? actually. Cool. Uh, I worked for Jameet Singh uh, for a number of years. Uh, the current federal leader? The current federal okay. leader. Uh, that is actually where I got my start in politics, um, was with him in his office. And we did a lot of work around employment standards legislation. Legislation uh, and uh, looking at temporary help agencies uh, in Brampton in particular. It's a very large issue for us. Uh, so quite a lot of experience. So I've walked the halls of Queen's Park a few times, uh, but it's exciting to be there now as an MPP, obviously. Um, but I also founded my own nonprofit organization, uh, and we do arts-based social justice education. So always on the other side of the fence, I guess, in terms of advocating for communities. And I've served uh, as a board director uh, at uh, Community Living Ontario, which uh, is an organization that advocates for in, uh, individuals with intellectual disabilities to be included. So uh, quite a lot of experience sort of, um, you know, advocating for communities, working the system to make sure that people are being served justly. Uh, and that's kind of what inspired me to put my name on the ballot this round. Stephen, your political background. And you've worked for some politicians along the way, too, eh? I have. So, uh, notwithstanding my youthful look, Steve, uh, <laughs> my first campaign was in 1999 for a man named Al Paladini. And mm. if I may digress for 30 seconds, I had, I'm of the era where I recall emails being implemented in government and 
Christine will remember this period. I think you were working there at the time. And I sent this email to my member, Al Paladini. And you know, talk about the character of this man. And for context, for the for those watching, you know, he there thereafter deceased, sadly. But uh, I sent an email, and we should just let's a little more background. Please. Al Paladini was a cabinet minister in the Mike Harris government right. back in the 1990s, and he quite suddenly and tragically died. That's right. And creating a by-election, Greg Cerbera came in. Anyway, pick up the story. So I sent this email, and one day I'm going to go through the archives to see how preposterous my notation to him was, praising him on some youth employment event initiative he did. To his credit, talk about the character of this man, he called my home. And God bless my mother, Italian immigrant, typical, her name is Teresa, Mother Teresa, she will henceforth be known <laughs> as at this table. She's like, what the hell do you, does, does a senior cabinet want to talk to my son about? You know, she thought I did something wrong, of course, as any <laughs> child parent would. And the point is he called to say, I don't know what your party is, I don't know your ideology, I don't know your conviction. All I know is you clearly have a passion for public service and you should pursue it. And that really was the impetus for my involvement. I've been involved in the conservative movement ever since. And as you sort of, uh, um, you know, intimated, I worked for Prime Minister Stephen Harper for five and a half years and was able to serve the national government. And it really is a singular privilege to be on the side of the staffer side. I think all of us have had that experience. This is very different. And I think that transition from being the advisor uh, to the one being advised mm -hmm. is uh, maybe going to be a challenge for us all. I, 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 but certainly for me, I'm just so humbled by it. It's just cr incredible to think that, um, you know, you can come to this country, work very hard, and that, you know, one generation later, you can achieve this type of potential. And I think it's really unique in Canada and something that I'm sure for us all, we take great privilege and great honor. Christine, your political background. Well, I've uh, always been involved in politics. My family was involved uh, ever since we were young, my father and my mother. I had a great uncle who was a sitting MPP. And Who's that? Uh, his name was uh, General Hogarth. And that was back in the 30s, oh, so it's okay. very long ago. Uh, my, my husband, his uncle was a sitting MPP, which was Gaston de Meurs. So I've been married into a political family. My mm -hmm. husband actually ran once in Nickel Belt uh, back, I think, when he was 19 years old. Um, as I said, my mother is involved. My, my two grandfathers were involved in, in politics back in Port Arthur back in the day. And it's just something I always had a passion for. When I graduated university, I started uh, with the Mike Harris government. My first job out of school was to work for the Minister Chris Hodson in the Ministry of Northern mm -hmm. Development Mines and uh, Natural Resources. And I followed him through the, to be when he was chair of management board. And then I left Chris to only work for one of my favorite politicians, which was Mike Harris. So I ended up in the Premier's office. Uh, and then uh, when Mike resigned, I stayed with Ernie Eves. So such a privilege to be part of um, government uh, and to be there once again. But the difference between then and now is then it was a job. Today it's a responsibility. And it's a responsibility to our constituents, to my constituents, and uh, to the people of Ontario. So yeah, is your name on the ballot this time? My name on the ballot, it was very interesting to see my name on the ballot. You know, you run, I've looked after many campaigns, and it was interesting being the candidate versus the campaign manager or the sign chair or the volunteer co coordinator. It was very interesting being on the other side of the table. And it was, um, I know I'm not supposed to be in the campaign office, you know, because that was always my lesson to, uh, to my candidates was, you're not supposed to be in the campaign office. So, hey, I tried to take my own advice. And I just knocked on doors, and we knocked on thousands of doors. And it was a great experience to be on this side. And you really do learn a lot from the people. So we have a responsibility in this role. As I said, it's not just a job anymore. It's a responsibility to the people of Etobicoke Lakeshore. And it's a responsibility to the people of Ontario to make things better for everybody. And uh, you know, hopefully my municipal background as well. I worked in Sudbury for a bit for the mayor. I was chief of staff to Mayor Manichuk. And I was also um, worked for a local councillor, John Campbell. So some of that municipal experience, I hope, brings, uh, brings something to the table that uh, we can move forward with. Gotcha. Now you, you mentioned Sherry DeNova, whom yes. you worked for for how many years? Eight years. Eight years at <clears throat> Queen's Park. So, yeah. okay, so you, 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 you are, <laughs> you're new as elected members, but clearly you all come to the job with a lot more political experience than some. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think you all took part in an orientation session at the legislature earlier this week. Yes. What was that all about? It was very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that uh, I did as soon as we entered the chambers was really to go to the conservative side and introduce myself to all the MPPs uh, because, you know, we're all new to this job. We're all coming in with a lot of hope and uh, a lot of energy and enthusiasm to serve our constituents. And uh, it was just really nice to get to know each other, to know how the place works, uh, and, you know, not, not as a staffer, but within mm -hmm. the chambers. <laughs> uh, what do they the tell you? 
a lot of it was um, really just administrative logistics. But one of the things that I thought was really great and something that resonated with me was when the speaker asked us to think about what the other side might be going through, the responsibility that they have as the government, and for the government side to think of the opposition members and our job in terms of trying to keep the government accountable. So to always have the other side's perspective and try to be in their shoes. You'll note that today we did something a little unusual at this table here. Tory, New Democrat, New Democrat, Tory. <laughs> we didn't seat you on opposite sides by party mm -hmm. purposely uh, because politics has gotten so bloody toxic these days uh, that we didn't actually want to set it up as a confrontation here at the mm -hmm. table. And I wonder, uh, Christine, you first, how important is it to you? And if it's not, please be honest, but how important is it to you to take some of the toxicity out of politics nowadays? I think it's extremely important. You know, as we say, there's, there's, there's no monopoly on a good idea. You know, working, moving forward as a team is, is so important under the leadership of, of Doug Ford. But then we have, we have other people who will bring good ideas to the table, and that's not new to politics. So if Sarah comes up with a good idea, you're open to pursuing it? Absolutely. If it's something that has to do with our platform and will help the people of Ontario, I think that, it, that that's, our, that's our job. It's our responsibility right. to look at things. Let me go and serve the same way then. If the government comes up with a decent idea that you think actually does move the yardsticks forward in a positive way, would you give them credit for it? Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, again, to Christine's point, there is no monopoly on a good idea and good ideas need to be implemented. And I think our role is really to make sure that things are being implemented in a way that's fair and uh, keeping the government accountable and serving the people uh, of this province in a way that uh, they need Need at this point in time. Stephen, how about for you? How, how much of what you want to do over the next four years involves getting so much of the useless partisan excesses and crap out of politics? Okay. Uh, well, look, I accept the premise that, you know, parliamentarians need to work together to improve public policy. I didn't get into this uh, to create more impediments to our political system. I think our democracy, it actually is an imperative for us to serve our constituents first. So if that requires me to work with Sarah on legislation near Peel and York Region, then I will do that in good faith because my constituents expect nothing less. You do know you're all being recorded here, right? <laughs> you, like, you know we, we have the ability to play this back at some point. You know, fair enough, and okay. I'm happy to say it again. But I, I do want to say, you know, what, what, what took place at the orientation session I think was very important because it brought parliamentarians together, removing the political. I mean, notwithstanding that the new Democratic members sat in the opposition and, mm -hmm. and the government on our side, it created a sense of unity of purpose, that we have to serve a greater entity than one's party, and that's the people of this province. And that's a message that was echoed by our by the Premier-designate, Doug Ford. He made it very clear. We are here to serve the people. I, I'm not trying to invoke the For the People slogan, Steve. I know you're, <laughs> you just did. you're giving me an eye, but, but yeah. truly reminding ourselves that it is the, it is the, the taxpayer and hardworking people in this mm -hmm. province who deserve government to be okay, on their side. Okay, let's try this then. Because I asked this question four years ago when we had newbies around the table uh, on that occasion as well. And I'll tell you a, a very funny story once I ask you first about how that turned out. On the 29th, the new Ford government will be sworn in, which means on the 28th, a bunch of phone calls are going to go out to some people saying, would you please, would you like to join the cabinet as the minister responsible for dot, dot, dot. You want to be in cabinet? Well, of course, we all want to be in cabinet. Uh, but, you know, my job is, I, I didn't run to be in cabinet. I ran to be the MPP of Tobacco Lakeshore. You want to be in cabinet? I, I like that answer because I truly, you know, I, I'm an incrementalist. I got in with a simple mission, and that's to serve my constituents. And I'd be, the fact that I have this privilege is in itself an achievement that I feel very proud of. When we asked the question four years ago, I asked the director to go to a wide shot, and I said, I want to see a show of hands. And remember, there's a lot of liberal newbies on that program said, who wants to be in cabinet? None of the liberals put their hands up. <laughs> Jennifer French, the NDP MPP, put her hand up. She said <laughs> she wanted to be in cabinet. She was in third place after that election. Uh, so she's uh, still waiting to be in cabinet. And it's not a question for you two, but do you, do you go to the leader, Andrea Horvath, at some point and say, here's what my passion is, and I would love it if you'd make me critic for that area? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have, have you done that yet? Yes, I have. And what is it? My passion is public health. So and you'd love to be the health critic? No, not necessarily. Public health is a very big portfolio, mm -hmm. right? And within public health, my passion is social determinants of health. And so what I think is, is that health and healthcare is always top of mind of people's 
is, is a top of mind issue for Ontarians, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's an election or not. But I think that what we don't talk enough about is what are the social factors that drive health, things like housing, fair wages and benefit, the environment. So you could be critic for any of those things and that'd be fine with yeah. you. <laughs> In every way, there is an angle to health. Mm. And so what I want to do is, you know, no matter whatever I'm assigned, I want to make those connections to health and community health okay, and Sarah, to try and bring a change. How about you? Have you made your preferences known to the leader's office? Uh, not just yet. Uh, we have a meeting slated for later this week, uh, so hopefully then okay. I can share some of my interests. But uh, no, absolutely, I think uh, it's going to be exciting as we await, uh, you know, cabinet uh, slate uh, from our conservative counterparts. Uh, you know, I think uh, Patella and I share that same passion for community development and understanding the intersections of how all of these different uh, ministries actually function together. Uh, so I'd be happy with any any. Role. Okay. I want to ask as well, because you, you, for almost every politician, there comes a moment where you have to sit down and debate within your own, I don't want to get too heavy here, but within your own conscience or within your own soul, my party wants me to do this, I think my constituents would rather I did this, and here's what I may feel about the issue, and those may be three entirely different things. Stephen, to you first, how will you resolve that moment and have you thought about that moment yet? Look, I think for anyone in public service, there's always a question of you know, per, one's per private conscience and their constituents. And I understand it's a struggle many of us have faced or will face going forward. I think my default position always is to really serve my constituents. I have a singular mandate and that is to be the voice of my constituency. I'm not delivering Queen's Park's objectives in my riding, I'm bringing King's Vaughan's priorities to Queen's Park. And I think all parliamentary should operate by that principle. It's certainly how I'm going to govern myself over the next four years. I've spent the last 10 days, you know, reaffirming uh, our campaign commitments because we made it clear over the last 30 odd days we're going to implement our agenda. We've got no, to get uh, it through. I understand that, but but and Christine here. I mean, let me give you an example that will be very close to home for you. Uh, you know, I do remember a time when Charles Sousa, who's one riding over in Mississauga opposed his own government on the issue of building a gas plant in the southern end of mm. Mississauga. And he campaigned against the premier of the day, Dalton McGinty, saying, I don't want this here. We don't want this here. And the campaign went on for a long time, and eventually he won. Now, that was a case where he, where he was very much on the side of his constituents and very much against the side of his own government and premier. Have you thought about that kind of a scenario for you personally and how you would handle it? Well, I, I think, as I said, this is not just a job, this is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in progressive conservative my entire life, and I do believe in our principles, uh, and I do believe in our platform we brought forward. One of the reasons I, I put my name on the ballot was because of the, the, the platform we brought forward. Um, the, the, the differences of being an MPP is you have a responsibility to the people who elected you, and not everybody did. Not everybody agreed with, uh, the majority obviously did, but there's still that part that you have to make sure that we're doing what's right for the people in our community. To me, that's my first priority, is, is trying to reflect um, what the people want. So you would, go, you, uh, under the right set of circumstances, you would go against your own party's position if you thought it was in conflict with what the people in Lakeshore want. I would, you know what, I would have to, I'd have to look at it really, really seriously and, and, and think if it's something against our platform, our platform was, we did get endorsement from all across the province on our platform. Mm -hmm. And we also got the majority of votes in the riding on our platform. Sorry, when you say platform, you guys didn't really have a well, fully costed did. platform. You know well, that, right? Well, there was a platform. There was a platform. <laughs> well, it was a plan for the people. <laughs> it was a plan for the people, and it was to make life better mm -hmm. for people of Ontario because, you know, times are tough. And if you knocked on doors, that's the first thing you heard. And more, more interesting is people were interested in getting our finances in order. That was the number one thing. It wasn't, it was hydro as well, but let's get our finances in order and that's the number one thing we're doing right now is, is taking a look at that. So moving forward, yes, I would have to look at uh, what, what the situation was and if it's something that was not in our, in our platform, <laughs> I would certainly uh, have to weigh those odds. I like the way you laughed after you said platform. <laughs> well, it, there is a platform. <laughs> Now, are you talking about the People's Guarantee, or are you talking about something else? Well, we had the plan for the people. It's, uh, it's, on, it's on the party's website. It's, it's there, and it is costed out. Every time uh, Doug Ford did an announcement, there was a cost behind it. But not necessarily how the money... Anyway, we don't have to get into that again. <laughs> we're, we're trying to keep it Disney here tonight. Uh, let's try this. I want to, I want to ask the four of you to... Because I did this four years ago with uh, those rookies, and I want to do it again here tonight. So please complete the following sentence. My time in public life, however long it lasts, will have been worth it if... 
what? Sarah. It's a great statement. Um, well, I think uh, my time in public office would have been worth it if we were able to change the face of government uh, and inspire hope and optimism within our public service. Is there anything in particular in your part of Brampton that you would like to see done? Absolutely. So for the people of Brampton, not just in Brampton Centre, across the city, uh, a big struggle for us is absolutely health care. Um, and so that's something that uh, I'll, I'll be fighting for uh, to make sure that we're getting the dollars we need to service the community that has been so long neglected uh, for the last 15 plus years. Does that mean a new hospital for uh, Brampton? Hopefully a new hospital. And that's something, again, that uh, with my counterparts from the other side, uh, hopefully we can work on and, and have discussions about what that community needs um, and understand uh, that we need to serve that community community first. Uh, as you alluded to, there wasn't really a clear plan in terms of what we would be getting in Brampton. Uh, the NDP, we always, uh, throughout the uh, entire election campaign, indicated that health care was a priority, especially in Brampton, um, because we understood this was sort of, um, you know, the beachhead for the crisis, hallway medicine. Um, and so there, there needed to be solutions. So I would, uh, at the end of, you know, however long I'll be able to serve the people for, um, I'll be very satisfied to know that we were able to increase services and access to healthcare supports in our community. Okay, Stephen Lecce, my time in public life will have been worth it, regardless of how long it lasts, as long as what? Every single Ontarian in my constituent can see, could achieve their full potential. And I think when you meet a lot of young people in this province, among others, you know, as Sarah sort of alluded to, there, there's a, a sense of hope and optimism that has driven the spirit of this province since Confederation, an in, industri in industry, industrial frontier of, of, you know, production, of innovation, of employment. I think that's been lost. And I think if we can restore that spirit of entrepreneurship in this province, give people opportunity, you know, help them get the dignity of good jobs, not any job, a good job, a well-paying job, that is, I think, a metric of success. And, you know, more specifically, uh, I share the objective of healthcare. In Vaughan, we have the first new hospital being built in 20 years. And my mission is to operationalize that hospital. Uh, the hospital closures, about the wait times have increased so significantly. And in my writing, I heard this all the time. And the Premier does it. Doug Ford has a plan to reduce hospital wait times. And that is a consequential issue in my writing. Uh, and look, in Brampton Civic, and you know, we heard about the hallway medicine at that hospital. My, our, your colleague, my colleague Prabhmeet and Amar Jot and others, they've made it very clear that we need to fix it. And I think the fact that our caucus is so focused on delivering for their communities, like localized, granular, achievable objectives, I think will serve people well. Uh, in every province, in every region of this province, our caucus is united in that sense. And so uh, expect us to work hard on the economy, mission number one. Look, the, the Premier has already come out. He's not even been sworn out, Steve. Mm -hmm. And he's already focused on reducing gas prices by 10 cents. He's already focused on restraining you know, the size of government and ensuring that we get value for money after you know, many years of, uh, you know, permit me to say, wasteful government. So I think that that immediate uh, signal to the population that we are acting quickly, we're going to implement our agenda, uh, and we're going to listen along the way. I mean, I'm spending the next, I guess, the first 100 days, if you will, if we're going to accept the nomenclature, listening to my constituents. I, I really want to understand what are their priorities and how could I be the best champion in, in the legislature okay. in September. Christine, your time in public life will have been worth it, regardless of how long it lasts, as long as what? We make it better for people. And, and, that, and that's different for each person, right? Somebody might be somebody who is helping them with their hydro bill, lowering that. Someone might be gas tax. Some might be health care, hallway health care, you know, looking after our seniors, making sure they have dignity when they're in the, in the hospital system, making it easier for a family who have to put somebody in a long-term care facility, making that transition easier. So to me, it's something different for every person. Every constituent will have a different make it better for them. And I think that's important. I think that's what we have to think about. It's not about me. It's about, it's about them. It's, um, it was, it's not, never about the, the actual the MPP themselves. It's, our job is to, is to serve. And that's all about serving. And if we can make life better for people, I think that's an accomplishment. And I think that our platform, <laughs> we talk about that again, had some key things that will help the people of Ontario. And I think that's why it was overwhelm, overwhelmingly um, uh, accepted by the people of Ontario. Is there anything in particular in the south end of Etobicoke that you want to achieve? Well, we have uh, transit issues. Uh, we, we uh, along the Humber Bay Shores area, we've had uh, 28,000 new residents in the, over the last 10 years with no exit plan. You know, sometimes when we do this development, and I think that's where municipal government uh, and provincial government cross, you know, we have all this development with no plan to get these people out of their homes. And um, I'd like to see a GO train there. I'd like to certainly push on the park long GO. Okay. 
Butila, mm -hmm. your time in public life will have been worth it as long as you can what? I work every day to put the needs of people first. And I think that that's what we've seen the government not do for a very long time. People feel that their needs are being ignored. Uh, when I talk to people in Park Del High Park, they tell me they need affordable housing. They tell me they need access to universal programs like pharma care and dental care. They need schools that are in proper, ma properly maintained schools, schools where the roof is not leaking, things like that. So I want to make sure that I work hard every day to put the needs of Parkdale High Park constituents first. Okay, let's do one last thing here, which is there are no liberals represented at this table, as we said at the top, because they didn't elect any new members. However, all of you have a bit of a decision to make as it relates to what is left of the Ontario Liberal Party. They have seven members, eight is official party status. I'd like to know, can we go to a wide shot here? <laughs> Hands up, who would vote to grant the Liberals official party status, change the rules so that even if they only have seven, that's enough? No hands going up. <laughs> All right, interesting. Stephen, you want to tell me why? Sure. Uh, for, well, don't don't read into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the point is the population, the people of Ontario, have resoundingly rejected the Liberal Party. I mean, let let us be clear. The numbers speak for themselves. They were resoundingly rejected after 15 years of mismanagement. And I think there ought to be accountability for a government that that has run themselves as they did. Uh, and so first off, uh, let's accept the reality of uh, the democratic will of the people who we represent. The second is. Look, I've been getting tons of correspondence. We were talking about this before in the ante room. People are emailing congratulations and already lobbying for priorities, and that's fair game. Mm. Not a singular person, not one, Steve, not one person has urged me to expend more taxpayer dollars to, to a political party. Not one. The opposite is true, perhaps, but certainly not that. So, you know, this is a decision that we made in the coming weeks, obviously, and it'll be made by people above my pay grade in some respects. But I do believe that you know, my mission is to protect taxpayer dollars and to respect the will of the people, okay. and read into that as you will. Batila, you were were you in um, were you in Sherry's office when when the tide was? No, I don't think you were. No, I think this no, was before no. your time. It was before my Cause time. Because there was a moment, obviously, in history where the Liberals had to make the decision on whether to grant official party status to the NDP, which didn't quite meet the threshold. Which and, they didn't. Which they, <laughs> and they opted not to do it. That's yeah. right. So turnabout's fair play, eh? <laughs> no, I think you know, as Stephen just said, uh, the. Voters decided that, right? And I think that if there is going to be any change of rules in terms of whether it's going to be, a, you know, a lowering of the threshold to party status, uh, that is a decision that is going to be made by the government. Um, but as far as the election outcome goes, we have to respect what the voters have decided. And we have to respect the clock, which tells us time is up. I want to thank all of you for coming on our program tonight and sharing your views with us. Butila Karpoche, the new member for Parkdale High Park. Stephen Lecce, the new member for King Vaughan. Sarah Singh, the new member for Brampton Centre. Not quite Bill Davis's MPP, but pretty <laughs> close. And Christine Hogarth, the new member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Uh, good luck over the next four years. Thank Rookies, you. have a good thank time. You. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.